Thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, the GDPR Year One in Review. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Joining us today is Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spirian. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Welcome, Scott. Please take it away. Wonderful. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started here. Welcome to GDPR one year anniversary. Let's go to the next slide. If you leave with nothing else today, all the violations that I'm gonna be talking about here were for basic data protection failures. So weak legal bases, poor document retention practice, weak or just non-existent controls, and my favorite, a blasé attitude towards data protection. So a lot that we can learn from these cases. Google is the big one, it's the noteworthy one, but there's a lot of other ones that even though they're not noteworthy in the sense they're not household names, there's still a lot we can learn from them as well. And uh, what you'll find is most of these organizations did not have a formal data protection program. They didn't have especially high standards. Some probably didn't have any standards at all as a practical matter. So we'll talk about that. And uh, just not surprisingly, I'll talk about the virtues of a data inventory and why that's the core of an effective data protection program. So with that as a backdrop, let's talk about year one. So last week, or maybe the week before, the European Data Protection Board, which is both a data protection authority or a supervisory authority and a think tank on privacy and data protection, published, I would call it their one-year anniversary, but really it was in, in February, so it wasn't, or at least it was dated in February, so I wouldn't necessarily call it a one-year anniversary, but it's what we have done thus far. So essentially, I've gotten some bullets on the screen here, but really what we're going to find here is the net net of it is that about 55, 56 million euros penalties have been assessed. Now, admittedly, that's 50 million of which is from Google's. So that means there's about 6 million left across a little over 200,000 cases. So majority of the cases, about 45% were related to complaints. 31% were on the basis of data breach and the rest were everything else. So just a, a note for your data protection programs, the, the most likely route to getting an investigation is going to be on the basis of a complaint. And about half these cases have already been resolved. 1% uh, have been challenged before the national court. So interesting to see how those go. But in a nutshell, that's the, the fast facts. Now, there are, are some more fast facts I'm going to just zip through here because there's a point to this. So let's go to the next slide, Abby. So DLA Piper, they put together a paper. I put a citation here. In eight months since GDPR has been, um, been in force, according to them, almost 60,000 breaches have been notified, 91 fines as a result. Ireland's DPA has, at least as of the end of last year, has 15 open investigations, 10 of which concern Facebook or a subsidiary of Facebook like WhatsApp. Let's go to the next slide. The German supervisory authorities there's one in every um, every region there, every lander, issued 41 fines, the highest of which was about 80,000 euros. I put citations to all of these here. Um, in some cases, they don't necessarily give the name of the offender, but they give a, a story about the uh, about the penalty and what happened and, and what have you. So I've always put citations here so you can take a look at that. Swedish Data Protection Authority said that it re received about 3,000 complaints and about 3,500 reports of breaches. So most of these um, concern video surveillance and direct marketing. And I'm probably guessing the bulk of them were direct marketing because that's a, a consistent issue. Uh, again, I put a, a link to a citation there if you want to go read that. Let's go to the, the next slide here because this really raises a lot of question. And that is that, and, and many of you are thinking, so where are all the draconian fines? I think uh, there is a certain expectation that after May 25th uh, came and passed that these data protection authorities were going to be bringing the hammer down against all of these companies abusing our data and uh, bringing just multi multi billion dollar fines and all kinds of bad things were going to happen and that that's not been the case and i think it's probably an unfair expectation and i say that because for, for three big reasons one of which is that investigations take a while and they consume a lot of resources for example there is a ftc fine brewing right now for facebook and that's as a result of a violation of a prior settlement for violating uh, privacy regulations here in the us so investigations take a long time they consume a lot of resources and for every one you're investigating it's one that you're not investigating so they have to be very judicious in terms of what they do for investigating a given complaint 
So another thing is that the enforcement statistics we're getting now are current as of more or less February. So keep in mind, we still have until this month, essentially, that there's probably things that have, re- that have happened that have not been yet reported. Also, as of Monday, so a couple days ago, Ireland's DPA has opened 54 investigations thus far. So um, the good news, if you want to call it that, at least if you're an investigator, is, is that they've spun up quite a few investigations in a relatively short time. Also, keep in mind that as supervisory authorities become more experienced, you can expect more investigations and more significant penalties. And the, the, the analogy I want to draw is think about in the U.S. here, where we've got every state's got an attorney general. They're very good at criminal and civil investigations. They've been doing this since the state was founded. So they've had a lot of time to become very good at this. DPAs have been around for a while. Now they're called supervisory authorities, but they've never really had the budget and the teeth they have now. So it's going to take some time for them to get spun up and get some investigations. Also keep in mind, too, that we tend to look at monetary penalties as a big deal. But injunctions can be far worse because if you get an injunction where the DPA or the SA says, hey, you're not processing personal data anymore, that can basically put you out of business. So then that's that's well within the wheelhouse to issue injunctions. So it's something that the potential of which is scary, but it doesn't show up as a dollar figure. So keep that in mind as well. Let's go to the first and the, the big case, and that's Google. So let's talk about Google. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. And so what's interesting about Google here is this was not a breach. Okay, and it's an important distinction to make. There was no breach of data here. They were punished for very basic GDPR and even uh, data protection. If you think about the original data protection rule, the um, data protection directive from really 1995 on, that a principle of that was this idea of having a legal basis to process personal data. That is what was at issue here. So transparency, giving people information, giving getting consent in this case that was the the vehicle for the legal basis as a result uh, the fine was 50 million euros that was back in january and that was as a function of a uh, or a lawsuit that or a complaint rather it was filed by max schrems uh, you've probably heard of max schrems he was uh, indirectly responsible for getting safe harbor torpedoed so as a consequence he's now involved in several actions several complaints with eu authorities if we go to the next uh, slide, I'll, I'll really dig into this here. So when we talk about transparency, we talk about giving people the information they need to make decisions about whether they should consent or not. So you need essential information to be able to do so. Here, essential information was scattered across documents. So you had to take multiple steps to accumulate everything and determine, okay, what is Google doing with your data? And the CNIL, which is the uh, the French DPA, the French Supervisory Authority, said that the operations are particularly massive and intrusive because there are about 20 of them, and uh, just the, the volume, the nature of the, the data process and combined. So really, as a practical matter, there was really no way to know all the things that were going on with personal data. Let's go to the next slide and decide, well, okay, how does this map to GDPR? Because we really want to find given articles. Well, Articles 12 and 13. 12 says you have to give information in a clear, transparent, intelligible, easily accessible form. It's got to be in clear language, meaning the kind of language you would see in a end user license agreement is probably a bad idea. And so the purposes of the processing have to be indicated. So the legal basis as well. Uh, do you're using consent or using the um, a commerce transaction of some type, something like that who the recipients are. So lots of information has to be given under Article 13. Uh, Arguably, Article 14, which is when you get data from someone else other than the data subject, has even more restrictions, more information you have to give. So these are the two articles here that were implicated. And if we go to the next slide, so let's talk about consent. So there's six legal bases, six, uh, if you want, six reasons that are legitimate why you could process someone's personal data. As a practical matter, though, probably 99% are either going to be consent of the data subject, there's a contract like an e-commerce transaction, or the legitimate interest of the controller. The problem that we have here, there's, there's always problems. Uh, consent, we'll talk about in a minute. Contract, In many ways, the issue is, okay, great, you've got a contract. Once the contract is over, unless you have a reason to keep the data, you've got to get rid of it. And then legitimate interest to the controller, the challenge with that is that if you don't have a good legal basis, a lot of times controls will just say, oh, it's legitimate interest. Well, that's not the idea behind legitimate interest. You're not supposed to just use that as a default. You really have to have legitimate interest. You have to have it documented, and you have to have it documented before you actually collect the data, uh, which is something that I think was not being done 
prior to GDPR. So as a consequence, use that one very carefully and always involve your outside counsel, your inside counsel with that one. Let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about consent. So consent, that's the legal basis for why Google is processing your personal data. And so in the ads personalization section, essentially it is not possible to be aware of all the services, the plurality of services, websites and applications involved. So we think about it, you've got Google search, you've got YouTube, you've got Google home, you've got all these different sites, these different Google applications that you're using. And it's unclear on the amount of data that's processed and then combined. So you fail on the area of specific and you fail under unambiguous because it's just unclear what data is being implicated where among these 20 or so services. Also a big issue was this idea of the ads personalization section was pre-checked and that's a big no-no. And that's something that the, the authorities have said for years and years, don't pre-check, don't pre-tick boxes for consent. So they did that, that's a no-no. Also, GDPR requires specific consent for each purpose. Think about when you are downloading an application on your iPhone, your, your Android phone, what have you, and you'll check a box that says, here's all the things we're gonna do with your personal data. And there may be a laundry list, or maybe 30, 40, whatever it is things doing, and you're checking one box for all those things. Again, a huge no-no, and here Google got, uh, got stung by that. So what does that mean? It means that now when you sign one of these things, or you click on one of these things, you'll have 20 boxes to click on. Is that going to help? I don't know. But it's really, I think, where we're going to wind up going with a lot of these consent areas whenever you download an app or you're on a, on a website or you're doing some other kind of application. Let's go to the next slide. Just to summarize Google here before we go to the next one. So let's back up just one slide, Abby. So in summary, um, Google was the first big, the first noteworthy, if you want to call it that, 50 million um, euros. It could have been a lot more. The idea behind Google's issue was that it didn't lack, or it lacked rather, uh, legitimate consent, legitimate basis, because the consent that they had gotten, and again, this is very typical, I'm not picking on Google, certainly, the consent they had gotten really was based upon one checkbox and not really helping people understand what every application was, was involved, but vis-a-vis -vis their personal data, what personal data was being combined and used with others. So the lesson here really is that, and, and this is gonna be a hard lesson, is that whenever you have a service that offers all kinds of things and does all kinds of things, you're now gonna to have to break down the consent in a very granular way that we just haven't been doing historically. And as a consequence, it means that your consent forms are gonna be a lot longer and they're gonna to have to have a lot more information and it's gonna be something that's gonna be frustrating, but it's gonna be part of the process. So as a consequence, again, take a look at your consent right now if you're relying on consent. And I think probably the majority of companies, at least now, use consent because it's easy. But the problem is that uh, it's also challenging in that you have to be very specific about what you're doing and communicate that to the data subject. Before we go on, Abby, questions, comments about anything we've gotten thus far? Yes, we do have one question so far. It's, sure. can you give an example of an injunction? I'm not aware of any injunctions that have actually taken place yet. They're still, in theory, something that could be done. But an injunction would be if a company is processing personal data, perhaps they've already been warned. They've done something wrong. They've been warned in the past. And the regulator is simply at the end of, the, of their rope and said, you know what, uh, we're tired of policing you guys. We're simply going to forbid you from processing personal data anymore. And they would just enter the equivalent um, here in the U.S., they would file an injunction, the, the recipient of that would fight it out, and if the judge agreed the injunction was legitimate, then it would stand and that would be it. You couldn't do whatever you were doing. In the EU, it's probably a very similar process, but the net net of it is that I would think would be a last resort, but it's still a resort and it's still a threat. And so it's something that you always have to consider is how much irritation are you gonna give the, the authority before you, you comply? Uh, most organizations are just gonna do what the authority says and be done with it. Some, though, tend to test the patients. I won't name them, but there are some, I think we all know who they are, that tend to test the patients of regulatory authorities. And as a consequence, those um, have the potential to, uh, to get an injunction. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about some others. And again, I'm going to preface this by saying that a lot of these are cases that you likely have not heard of. I had to really dig for these. In some cases, they were only published in the native language of the foreign country, so a little Google Translate had to be used. So forgive me if some of these aren't absolutely just scintillating in, in terms of how interesting they are, but 
What I like about all of these and I'm gonna talk about is that they really illustrate exactly what can go wrong. And uh, I mentioned earlier, my, my favorite weakness is a blase attitude. You're gonna find that seems to be a common thread, a blase attitude about protecting people's personal information. So let's talk about BizNode and again, apologies if I'm not pronouncing any of these, these companies correctly, but um, BizNode is a data aggregation company headquartered in Sweden and uh, they scrape, I'm guessing, information from public databases and registers. They're providing some kind of verification services. Again, not exactly sure what the, the services are, but they verify personal information. So the data is focused for entrepreneurs and business owners. And in terms of what the volume was, it was not quite 6 million records of personal data that were in scope. So earlier I mentioned that Article 13 and 14 of GDPR require you to inform data subjects. Article 14 requires you in particular when you're getting data from things other than the data subject, you have to give them a long list of things. So let's go to the next slide and I'll show you some of them. I didn't put them all here because the, the, there's just a lot of material. So you can see here that when personal data has not been obtained from this data subject, controller has got to get all these things, identity and contact and details of the controller, the contact details of the DPO, purposes of processing, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it, again, it's a long list. I spent a lot of time with clients when I was um, in my previous company just getting all this information and packaging it up because it just, it made for a very long privacy statement. So this is something that the business had to do to uh, let them know their data subjects, what data they were processing. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see there were some hiccups here. So out of about not quite 6 million, I believe it was, or 15 million, look, back up a slide in one sec. Abby, I want to see what that number was again. I apologize. And back up one more slide, it was 5.7 million. Yeah, 5.7, okay, so it's not quite 6 million records. If we go ahead two slides here, what you're gonna find is that they were only able to contact 90,000 individuals because those are the records that had emails in there. Um, for the rest, Bizno just put a notice on the website saying, hey, by the way, here's the information that we're processing. Here's where we got it from, et cetera. 12,000 people objected. So that's a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty long list of, of objections to the Polish DPA. And so Bizno, they said, well, sorry, but it wouldn't be too expensive if we had notified them by mail. The Polish DPA disagreed with that uh, line of reasoning and fined them 220,000 euros or the equivalent thereof. So what was interesting about this is that there was no damage established to the data subjects. However, the, uh, the Polish DPA, the UODO, didn't consider this to be a mitigating argument. So uh, I find that an interesting uh, element of this because here in the US, typically speaking, whenever privacy class actions are filed, uh, they've often failed because it's very hard to prove damages above and beyond the aggravation someone gets when their personal data is stolen. If you can't show that anything's been done with it, it's very hard to be successful with, at least as an individual, with going after companies for, for data breach. Here, the DPA said, we don't care that we can't show damage or that the individuals can't show loss, we're still going to punish you anyway. Let's go to the next slide. Again, just to summarize BizNode, with the most important issue here was being able to get information to data subjects before you were processing their personal data, give them an opportunity to determine whether they want their personal data processed and to give them enough information to understand exactly what's going on. Here, that didn't take place. So next one up is called Rousseau. Um, and this is the first GDPR find by the Italian supervisory authority, the Garante. So Rousseau, they're a data processor. They operate websites for a major Italian political party. And there was a breach that they suffered in 2017. And so the Garante ordered them to make some changes. And these changes you're about to see are really things, thank you, things that you would expect should be done in the first place. So vulnerability assessments, having strong passwords, strong protocols for data in transit, protecting passwords, again, that seems to be a common theme here, auditing, et cetera. There's also some additional ones that I think were particular to this one, particularly egregious. So poor security of log files. So a bad guy could come in and delete log files and hide their presence. Um, system ends using shared accounts with excessive user privileges and then inadequate anonymization of user activities. That's because this is a voter site. So you want your voters to be able to be anonymous. So these are just some of the things that were going on. Again, InfoSec 101, as you've probably heard me say on other webinars, what went on here. Let's go to the next slide and we'll, um, we'll dig a little deeper into this. 
So there's a report, I put a link there uh, that DLA Piper published. Um, all InfoSec staff should read the report, it's really good. The Garante mandated changes, they were not made, so they made an additional order after the May 25th deadline from last year for GDPR. As a consequence, they could find them under the GDPR. And the fine was 50,000 euros uh, for Article 32, which is the data security the primary data security article. And what does it say? Processors shall implement appropriate technical uh, organizational measures uh, appropriate to the risk. So that, of course, raises the question, did the processor do a risk assessment to get an idea whether there, the nature of the risk, how big it was, what needed to be done to mitigate that, et cetera? So whenever you see this idea of something has to be an appropriate level of the risk, the implication there is that there needs to be some kind of a risk assessment. They don't come out and, and shout that, but that's essentially what they're saying. And so if someone did an inspection, they would want to see the risk assessment, presumably. So this is the first fine for a data processor that also didn't include the data controller, which is very interesting. Typically, the data controller does something wrong, or rather, I'm sorry, the data processor does something wrong. They'll go after the data controller for being incompetent, for picking the data processor in the first place or not policing them or that kind of a thing. Here they didn't uh, punish the data controller. So interesting uh, angle on this. And again, the first one by the Garante. So before we go on, Abby, comments or questions from the audience? We do have a question pertaining to Google. Sure. Aside from sure. the fine, have they sought to reconsent? Oh, it's a very good question. I haven't seen whether they've sought to the reconsent. I will go run it to ground though and see what's happened, what's changed since then. It may be that Google is going to contest it and therefore they won't have made any changes yet, presumably. But let me run it to ground and then I'll answer that uh, when I, um, uh, I post everything to the blog and um, we'll have more. So I'll have something for you guys next week and, uh, and we'll see. That's a good question. Great. That's all we have for now. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Well, let's go to the next one. So this is on, from Denmark, and this is a, a taxi company called Taxa. I presume it's 4 by 35 Again, I'm making this up a little bit. I'm not quite sure exactly the name. Also, this is the first fine for Denmark's supervisory authority. I'm, I'm not going to pronounce their name, but we'll just call them the, the Denmark supervisory authority. So Taxa 4 by 35 is a taxi service, and they claim to anonymize personal data after two years by deleting the name of the data subject. And then after five years by deleting their telephone number, however, they use the telephone number as an account number, which probably, as you, you're going to guess here, uh, the, the, the moral of the story is don't use telephone numbers as account numbers. Probably not a good idea. So the supervisory authority inspected the company and their data retention claims and found fault in four areas. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see some examples here, probably familiar with all of these areas by now. So one was anonymization, this idea that you could just anonymize or delete someone's name and that would anonymize things. Well, it, it's very easy to reconstruct a record from all the other data that's out there. And so as a consequence, just getting rid of a name is just not enough. So anonymization, you really have to do more. And there's been a lot published on the statistical issues of anonymization and what have you. So as a practical matter, and I'll put a link in the answers that I post to the website, uh, in the blog about uh, a great uh, HIPAA document that talks about uh, uh, anonymization. So anonymization did not go well. Data min minimization. This is the idea, don't use more data than you need. Well, here they use a telephone number as an account number, which is a bad idea since you can just create a unique identity number, a unique ID, and just work with that instead of using someone's uh, telephone number or here in the US using their social security number, et cetera, et cetera. Next one is legal basis. And we've talked a lot about legal basis here. So the idea of why you're collecting that data. Well, the problem here is that when asked, Taxa gave a very vague explanation as to why they were using the data they were collecting for a different purpose than it originally contemplated, which presumably was to contact the person that they're going to send the taxi to. Um, they're using it for uh, account IDs, which is really something that they didn't contemplate, at least you would think if you're an end user, if you're um, someone who's been ordering a taxi, that your data is gonna be used as an account identifier. So the legal basis was an issue, they were a, a bit sketchy. And then if we go to the next slide, deletion and retention here. So the idea about deletion and retention is that you keep it as long as you need it. When you don't need it, get rid of it. This is the idea of necessity. And this is the question I get a lot about, well, Scott, can you give me a list of data retention schedules for the EU? And the answer is there aren't any, to my knowledge. It's a question of how long is it necessary to keep it, 
you have to determine as a data controller how long to keep it, and then once that point is reached, get rid of it. So the other article here is, is Article 5 Sub 2, which is you have to be responsible to demonstrate compliance. So here what happened is the taxa used a manually updated deletion log, which needless to say, not going to be terribly up to date and not terribly effective in the sense that people are gonna be handwriting errors into this and what have you. And there's no way to really force people to keep updating the thing like there would be if it was electronic and, and you force them to update it, otherwise they wouldn't let you go further in the system. So essentially it was a really weak way of managing data retention. So the net net of it, well, let's go to the next slide here, is that, and I've got two reports here. One is in English, one is in, in Danish. So the net net of this is that uh, I talked earlier about uh, blase attitudes. This is probably a good candidate for blase attitude towards, towards data protection. And um, what happened is that this data controller really didn't have a good grasp on just what personal data uh, needed to be used and what didn't. And as a consequence, we created this huge database of information that uh, had the potential for being leaked and leaking all kinds of things about someone that really they just didn't need once the transaction was completed. And you can contrast that with credit card processing where any information that's not needed for the future, which is very little, gets dumped as soon as a transaction takes place. So a good example, just or a good counter example of that. All right, let's go to the next one. So this is in Norway municipality of Bergen. So this was a fine for 170,000 euro and uh, a, a fine by the um, Norway's supervisory authority, which has the same name as the other one we just uh, discussed. So just FYI, I'm not going to pronounce that one either. So personal data of 35,000 people, this was primarily children. And so this could be accessed by anybody. There was really no meaningful protections in place. You could get passwords, but also dates of birth, the address, um, school grade. And then this was really scary. You could get the teacher's evaluation of each individual pupil's performance at school. And you can imagine all the things that a, a teacher would be writing about a pupil that would be available. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty scary prospect. I put a link here to, uh, to the entire story. So the municipality evidently had been warned about the problem and it had not been fixed. And just as a memo item, if you will, if an organization's been warned once and nothing's been done, you can expect the hammer to get brought down. So here, if we go to the next slide, uh, two articles uh, implicated here. One is, is Article 5, and this, is, this Article 5 really tends to cover all the principles of GDPR in one article. So if you haven't taken a look at it, it's often overlooked, but it's important because it's very general, but it also covers all the principles. It's something that gets cited a lot whenever I'm reading these fines and penalties and, and act enforcement actions because it's almost always implicated in some form or fashion. So here it's talking about appropriate security to protect the integrity and the confidentiality. So that's Article 5, Sub 1. And if we go to the next slide, Article 32, which is, we talked about it earlier, it's the data security one. Let's go back for a second, Abby. I want to finish this idea. So Article 32 is going to be implicated a lot because you have both technical and organizational measures. And we talked earlier about organizational measures, the idea of contracts, of procedures and policies, incident response plans, data classification programs, all those kind of things, those are all organizational controls. So it's just as easy to get punished for lack of organizational controls that is as protectable ones. In fact, because organizational controls are on paper, if you will, uh, you don't really have good excuses to not being able to, to have one versus saying, oh, we can't afford a firewall or we can't afford to harden our enterprise or whatever it is saying we don't have the budget for that, it's harder to argue that you don't have an organizational control available. So Article 32 can be, uh, be an issue for both of those reasons. Scott, I do have a question for you in sure. regards to sure, sure. Norway. Do they okay. not have uh, some type of FERPA-like law like we would have here in the United States? You know, it's interesting um, because, and just for the benefit of the audience here, FERPA, is the Federal Educational Records Processing Act, I believe it is. So essentially, it's the federal law that governs uh, student information. And if you're in university, you're, I'm sure you're more than an expert with it, certainly in all the other constellation of, of requirements you have for data protection. So uh, is there a version of FERPA? 
My guess, there probably is an existing one. My, uh, however, uh, the guess is that the GDPR probably provided more protection and probably more comprehensive protection in the sense that that the previous version, this probably was based upon the um, EU Data Protection Directive. This one's going to have more. So my guess is this probably superseded it and just had more, more breadth to it and more teeth as a consequence. So if there was a version of FERPA, it was probably superseded by this anyway, and it was probably stronger anyway, that, or their version of FERPA was probably weaker anyway, than, or at least not as comprehensive. So um, it's a good question. I think also keep in mind, too, that this idea of this federal versus state and municipal relationship we have here in the U.S. may not exist in Norway. It may not be big enough to have municipalities that are, have the ability to, to do major laws because they're not sovereign the way a state is sovereign here in the U.S. That's my guess, is that um, even if they did have that, uh, that kind of a law, it would have probably been um, overridden. So, good question, though. Anything else? That's all for now. Okay. If you have more questions, send them in, folks. So let's talk about Centro Hospitalar. And again, forgive my uh, not pronouncing that correctly. This is a hospital run on behalf of the government. And they were fined 400,000 euros. So it's pretty pretty serious here when you're talking about, uh, about penalties, especially for a hospital. And so what happened is there was a newspaper article on poor data handling practices that, uh, that happened. They precipitated an investigation. And which is a great way, by the way, to uh, get an investigation started. They had three separate violations and they, they were fined for uh, each separate violation. You don't necessarily have to do that, but here the, uh, the, the CNPD broke them out separately, which was nice. Again, I'm reading translations of things here from Google Translate, so forgive me if some of this is not crystal clear, but the principles are definitely crystal clear here. So uh, next slide, we'll dig into this. So articles, 5.1. So I mentioned Article 5.1. This is the general purpose principles, if you will, very easy to violate because they're general principles. And it talks about um, personal data being adequate, relevant, limited. So the idea that you don't collect more than you need. Whereas Article 83, sub 5, talks about what kind of fines you can do for this particular violation here. It's the 4% or 20 million the greater of which is available. So uh, what was fascinating about reading this is this idea of role-based access control almost certainly all of you on the call are familiar with, almost 300 doctors, but almost 1,000 active users with a doctor's access rights. So again, we're back to InfoSec 101. The idea that you're over-provisioning folks jumps out here. Also, a lot of doctors had rights outside their specialty. So for, give, for example, if you're an, um, a specialist in ear, nose, throat, and someone has a respiratory issue or something else of that nature where it's outside of your specialty, but you still had access to it. I'll just give you an example. That's the kind of thing that role-based access control would, would be addressing here that that was not in evidence, to say the least. And if we go to the next slide, Article 5.1 sub F, so talking about appropriate security, so protection against unauthorized processing, et cetera, et cetera. So the integrity of the, of the data. Here you had a very poor information security posture. So lack of technical and organizational controls, including documentation. And so I talked earlier about this, this virtue, organizational controls. That's documentation. And documentation here on criteria for developing user profiles. One of the things that I did when um, I was doing GPR projects is I would ask the question, who has the ability to grant user access? Who has the ability to determine who gets super user versus something even higher, like administrative access? Um, and what policies and procedures are around that? What reviews are around that? And almost invariably, the answer was no, there was nothing. That a, an admin could really just willy-nilly decide who gets what. And the problem with that is, is that you're going to have in inconsistent role-based access control. You're going to have people that are over-provisioned it's going to be a mess. And so um, as a consequence, having documentation like that is something I always recommend it and something that I think clients appreciate it, but just didn't want to do the work necessarily, but it's important to do so. And here's why, because when you don't have that criteria, then there's no way to develop it consistently. And you have a thousand people that have access to 300 um, doctors worth of material here. So and then um, finally, Article 32 1B, being able to document, again, there's that word, that they're ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience of, of treatment systems uh, and services. So we're back to documentation, and I'm hammering this idea because 
it's basic to your data protection program. And you all are probably on the call saying, yep, we know that. It's amazing how much documentation that you need to have a successful program. Here, it sounds like they were missing a lot of important stuff. So um, just in summary, and let's go to the next slide here. Great, thank you. So aggravating factors, special personal data because it was medical information. And that's something that uh, has a higher degree of, in terms of consent, you have to ex consent explicitly whenever there's special personal data, like healthcare data, or in some case, or uh, as a practical matter, things like showing religious affiliations or political affiliations or trade union activities, et cetera. And then secondly, uh, here the violation was willful. Okay, remember I mentioned earlier about having been warned and not correcting things, and well, now it's willful and willful really takes this to a high, uh, another level. So now the hospital appealed, stating that the CMPD is not the true supervisory authority. Uh, we'll see how that, uh, that card gets played. I wouldn't hold that a lot of hope. And it's a, the story is there. Um, again, it's, I think it's been translated, but uh, well worth a read uh, when you're setting up your data protection program. But as a practical matter, folks, it's all just documentation is such an issue. But also you can see here, we're back to the blase attitude. Uh, you can see how to, that's a thread that runs through this. Okay, let's talk about in data inventories real quick, and then I'm going to go and answer all the questions that got emailed in. And if you've got more, send them in. We'll we'll get them all knocked out here. So um, I'm going to do a blog post probably this week on a data inventory, specifically on the idea that if you're doing mergers and acquisitions, you want to be able to look for as one of your documents to examine, examine the data inventory because it's a living document. In principle, you're constantly updating it. Here on this, and this is a sample of a real one that I did when I was at Robert Half and, and with Protivity, you can see the area in red has the personal information as defined by GDPR um, for a system that is a, a, a mobile device management. So you can see on the cell phone devices, for example, the MZ and the IMA number and the device ID, electronic serial number, these are the, the pieces of personal information. And so for the one below it, which is the, the DLP system, um, you can see the equipment identifier, AD credentials. So a good example, again, of, of personal information that was uh, identified during the process of putting together the data inventory. The data inventory here that you're seeing here was actually huge. It was probably a couple hundred line items and maybe 30 columns. So a lot of, a lot of effort went into that, uh, went into that project. For purposes of, of M&A, it's important to understand that when you review this thing, you're really trying to get an idea of what the current state of data protection is, not something that took place in the past. So I know that with M&A, there's sometimes you look at a checklist and it'll say review past breaches, for example, which is important, but still not telling you what's going on today. The data inventory really is there to provide that current information and tell you what's going on at the moment. And it's something that really should be more or less constantly updated, either electronically or otherwise you have some kind of program to keep it evergreen. So. That's uh, my, uh, my discussion about data inventories. If you've been on my webcast before, you've heard them umpteen times, but it really is the core of your, your, your data protection system. You have to have this if you wanna be able to have effective data protection. So we've got plenty of time. Let's go and answer all kinds of questions that come up here. And like I said, if you got more, um, send them in. So is insurance growing more than applications in response to GDPR? I don't know per se if insurance is growing. I can tell you though that uh, there was a case that just came up with the um, a brand uh, acquirer, if you will, called Mondelez. And I, again, I, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. They've got all kinds of brands you're familiar with if at the grocery store, just all kinds of things that you would, uh, products you would see. They collect those brands, they market them, et cetera. They uh, had a breach. It was a pretty severe one. Uh, it was one of the major uh, malwares like non petya or something like that. And uh, they went to Zurich Insurance and, and tendered a, 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 the action for a claim, filed a claim, and it was denied because the non petya was considered an act of war by, uh, by the Russians. And so um, as a consequence, their claim was denied. And this is a big issue, and there's there's all kinds of court fights going on about this right now. So the net net of it is that if insurance was growing in response to GDPR, I don't know if it's growing now, just because if your insurance is not going to reimburse you for things like this, maybe it's not necessarily a, a good a good buy. I'm not saying yes or no, but here um, it's just kind of a, an example, a, a word to the to the wise here. Um, one of the things that I've harped on, if, if you've been on my webcast before, is that insurance coverage is not a control. 
Okay, so when someone says, oh, don't worry about it, if we get hacked, we've got insurance. Well, yeah, in this case, it didn't work. So I really wouldn't rely on insurance as a control, and that's not what it's there for. Okay, um, next one is, can you compare and contrast uh, CCPA to GDPR? I've done this before in other webinars, so let me tell you what the number one thing is you've got to look for, and that is you have to ask yourself on CCPA is what personal data do you have that you're selling to third parties? And I emphasize the word selling. Selling is very loosely defined. Unless you're throwing it out the window um, to all and sundry, which you shouldn't be anyway, if you're transferring data to a third party for any kind of compensation, you're selling it. And so then that raises the question, okay, well, you have to identify all the folks with whom you're selling it and then give contact information for all those folks because individuals have to have access to those folks to be able to say, don't use my personal information. So keep that in mind that that is the number one thing you've got to do, which then raises the question, how do you do that? You have to go to your data inventory and go find all your contracts. And I've been in many, many situations where the council involved didn't know where all the contracts were, didn't have a contract manager, let all the application owners manage the contracts, which is not really a good idea in my view. Someone has to own all the contracts and keep on top of them and audit them and find out what the third parties are doing. So that's the number one takeaway. If you do nothing else for CCPA, but make sure you know who's, who's uh, the recipient of data that's sold, you're gonna be in better shape than a lot of companies would be otherwise. The next question is, what does compliance mean? Will it be a certification like ISO 2701? The short answer is that uh, compliance from my perspective means that you're ready for battle. Okay, you're ready for the rough and tumble that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. You're not checking boxes on some kind of a form and saying, yes, we've done all these things. Uh, the question is, how do you function in, in under stress? If you're attacked by malware, if there is an issue about what your third parties are up to, if individuals within your organization are asking, hey, did you know that we're doing such and such with personal data? Should we be doing that? A couple of jobs ago, um, I was the privacy manager, basically. And people would show up at my desk and say, hey, did you know that we're doing such and such with personal data? And invariable, the answer would be no, I didn't know. How did that happen? So the idea that compliance is that you shouldn't be getting a lot of those did you know questions. So even if there was a certification like ISO 27001, still they, it, it raises the question, great, you have a cert, but how are you keeping the cert evergreen? How are you maintaining that program? Are you ready for battle? And that was the question I always asked clients when they said, you know, what do I have to do for GDPR? I would say when all is said and done, if you're ready for the rough and tumble of protecting personal data in a very highly dynamic environment, then, then you're in compliance. So being able to check boxes is not compliance. So I think that's the takeaway from that. Next one is lessons learned from breaches reported, and do we really need to report all potential breaches, including the ones leaked and posted on other websites, but used for credential, uh, credential stuffing, account takeover, et cetera, uh, against random sites? The answer is yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Uh, by the way, credential stuffing is when you grab credentials from one site and then try them on another and just keep trying until you get in. This is what happened with Uber, by the way. If you read the, the fine, uh, the report that the Information Commissioner's Office here in London did for Uber, you'll see that was an issue of credential stuffing. So the answer is, or the question is, do I need to really report these things? And the answer is yes, you do. If uh, it's more likely than not that a breach took place and personal data is involved, then yes, you have to you have to report. There's really no way. So the fact that you're you're attacking random sites or the bad guys are attacking random sites is not an excuse. You simply have to do it. So how are companies ensuring uh, compliance with different regulations such as GDPR and CCPA? One of the things that we did a lot when I was with Protivity was we did rationalization. Rationalization means that you you put up on a whiteboard all of the regulations that you're required to comply with. And then you, you cross-reference that with, with what your capabilities are currently. You look at all your applications and you say, okay, I have an HR system, I've got a learning management system, and I've got our production systems, I've got our legal database, I've got all these things. And then you make a big matrix and you find all the controls that are necessary, and then you look at the one that's gonna satisfy all the different regulations. So that rationalization is what we did, and that's a pretty common technique for everything nowadays. Um, it's been going on for quite a while, in fact. And so that's what we did. We looked at not just GDPR and anything else at the time. So it could be U.S. regulations. It could be things from Asia Pacific, wherever they had 
operations. And then you look at all the controls to determine what's going to answer the mail for all those kind of things. So that's, that's in a nutshell how you do that. It's a big project, by the way, but it's, it's a probably in many cases at least a year long, perhaps more, if you're really going to phase it out and put in some serious controls. Um, what are the overall impacts to government from a compliance potential uh, fines perspective? Under GDPR, government agencies are just as subject as anyone else to fines and to injunctions, by the way. In fact, I think that happened recently in the UK. I will run that to ground, but I believe that um, one agency basically got a, an injunction and the um, information commissioner's office just said, stop it. Stop processing the data because you don't know what you're doing. So um, I will um, run that down and I'll get that um, out to you guys on the blog post. But the net net of it is that as a government agency, you're probably going to be held to a higher standard. So you remember the, the case with the city of Bergen where uh, the municipality just was not on the job as far as protecting the data of uh, students. And um, they um, evidently, while well, we're warned about this, you can bet that in terms of, of fines and punishments, they will be more severe. One, because they were warned, and two, because you have children involved, and as a government agency, you're expected to, to uh, function at a higher level. Uh, U.S. federal government has to, uh, in terms of data protection, they have to use NIST 800-53, which is a pretty, pretty stringent system. Even the one for contractors, which is NIST 171, is also pretty stringent as well. So the net net of it is that they're just as susceptible as everyone else, probably going to be held to a higher standard because they're holding data in, in trust for the public here. So that's my analysis of that. And then finally, um, how do we, um, at least for now, how do we handle a situation where two U.S. citizens on a U.S. military base are having a professional conversation and need to exchange personal information? This is an unanswered question, unresolved question, I should say. So if you're in the EU, you're on a military base, and they're all over the EU, and you're exchanging personal information, does GDPR comply? The short answer is we don't know. So uh, that's the challenge uh, that we face right now. We, we know that for international institutions or diplomatic institutions, the answer is a little more clear, but for military bases, not quite so much. So that's where we are at the moment. And we still have a couple minutes left. Abby, any more questions rolled in? Yes, a few. Okay. Are you aware of any instance where the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the EU under Article 3 has been challenged by an American controller or processor? I have not. We know that the Canadian one did it that was related to Cambridge Analytica, and I don't know how that has uh, has fared. I should I should run that to ground as well for you guys. But as far as an American one, no, this has not happened yet, but I emphasize yet, it, I think it's inevitable. And then the question is, great, what happens if that controller doesn't have a presence in the EU? They uh, they just sell goods or services into it, perhaps for you know using e-commerce, but they don't, they don't have a presence. I'm uh, very curious to see how that's going to work. Um, I guess it'll be a political solution. They'll go to the FTC and try and twist some arms there, but um, let's see what happens. So um, that's the short answer right now. Great. So in regards to what you covered uh, regarding CCPA and GDPR and how they differ, do you foresee the rest of the U.S. going to a similar type of regulation? Yes, I do. I think it's almost inevitable. There's probably, I'm going to say, six to eight CCPA clones floating around right now in state legislatures. Now, we had one in Washington State. It almost snuck by, but uh, they killed it at the last day of legislative session that happened, I believe, last month. So um, not there with this session next year for sure, I think. Other states, yes, there's a bunch of other states. Texas has one floating around their legislature that's going through the legislative process. It's just a matter of time, folks. Almost as a practical matter, CCPA is going to be our our national standard, and other states will have their flavors of CCPA, but I think that cake is already baked right now. So if even if you don't do business in California, for whatever reason, and you're not processing data on behalf of some controller uh, that does business in California, this is the shape of things to come. It's going to happen. So my recommendation is to take a hard look at CCPA and see what it's going to require of you. It's not terribly different from GDPR. It's got some funny things in it um, in terms of working with third parties, like I mentioned earlier, but the writing is on the wall already. So um, that's, for better or for worse, that's where we are. Okay. Do you have any references or know of any instance in dealing with clinical trials and subject with GDPR? I do not, uh, but I will take a, uh, take a run at it and then post to the blog if I, if I see anything on clinical trials. 
it's not something I spent a lot of time with, but um, I say it's probably something that merits discussion anyway. It's probably, I know, a small universe of folks that have to deal with clinical trials, but uh, I will run it down and um, I'll post something to the uh, to the blog um, when I, uh, I get back from vacation. Okay, great. Do you think the CCPA, like state laws, will eventually extend to nonprofits? Yes, I do. I don't think there's any question about it. It will happen. I know that Oregon's version of the um, breach notification and also their essentially their requirements for um, for controls already applies to nonprofits. So we've got at least one state. Again, Oregon's not a huge state, but you're going to see this trend uh, roll in. I believe that the Ohio Data Protection Act also would inure to nonprofits as well. I'll have to double check that. They inure to a couple different kinds of entities like uh, chartered banks and so forth. So the net of it is that even though CCPA doesn't apply right now to nonprofits, if you're a nonprofit, you probably want to take a hard look at it as well. I think it's just a matter of time. Okay. Are you familiar with parties writing contract clauses broad enough to cover the requirements of both CCPA and GDPR? Oh, that's a good one. I'm not. And what's interesting about contract clauses is that Here's the funny thing about model contract clauses is that if you did add additional clauses, that's fine as long as they don't conflict with the existing clauses. Um, I remember one time way long ago, I uh, wrote some additional ones that had potential to conflict. I had to actually get the Belgian DPA to approve them, which they did. But uh, for a practical matter for CCPA, I'm not aware of anyone that's written clauses for both, but I suspect that Someone will do it. Um, also, if you're corporate counsel and you're a member of uh, ACC, I'm sure someone's probably going to do it and post it to their uh, their common set of documents. So um, I would definitely start looking. I'm sure some, if someone has not done it, they will do it and hopefully they'll share with the rest of us. Um, but at this point, I'm not aware of anyone that actually has made one that they've widely shared that covers both CCPA and uh, GDPR. Okay, I think that's all the questions that we have received for now. So I wanted to say thank you all again for joining us. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a link to the webinar recording will be provided in the coming days. Also, as Scott mentioned, please keep an eye on our website, www.spirian.com. Um, we'll get that blog posted with all of the answers to the questions as well. Thank you to Scott for a great presentation today. Uh, we hope to see you all at future webinars. Thanks. Have a good one.